I think this is the first year um, that there's going to be a real mass uh, event design um, landscape for virtual events where I don't believe uh, the majority of events, uh, the virtual events that took place in 2020 were, were truly designed um, at least to their potential. Like I, it, people, they talked about the word pivot so much that like it was a drinking game. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and like I, I think of it like, and I think we're still in it to some extent, but like as like almost like a little mini pivot era where you went in with a plan and you, you had to, you know, punt uh, and go with something else. Next year, based on all projections, it seems like there's going to be a lot of, I mean, there's going to be a lot less, let's say a lot less face-to-face -face attendees, period, at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the year where intentional experience design uh, will be used as opposed to pivoting, uh, which mm -hmm. is doing the best that you can. This is going to be more about, um, okay, we, we know this is going to happen. So let's, you know, let's use actually uh, design thinking to create some events. Hey, it's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Just follow us on social media to ask questions. Our iconic guests will answer them live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better the conversation. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just tell your friends to watch live on any of our social media channels. Now, without any further delay, this is hashtag event icons. All right, and we're live. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Um, just some housekeeping stuff right up front. Um, this is a live version right now. We will have a recorded version on our blog later on. But right now, feel free to ask any questions in the chat, whatever platform you're viewing on. Um, we can see them all. So um, yeah, throw us any questions throughout, comments. Um, and then if you want to see more, uh, event icons episodes feel free to go to www.event-icons.com so that's all the boring stuff to get out of the way but um, i'm really excited about today's episode um, i was thinking about a little bit of a bio because i feel like you have so much going on <laughs> um, the leader of um, borelli strategies holding a bunch of ilea positions beloved event brew host lover of energy drinks, <laughs> now a virtual teacher to kids. So um, yeah. yeah, I'm really excited to have our guest today, Nick Borelli. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I uh, always enjoy my time on Event Icons. Uh, if I'm, These are the only episodes really that I don't watch, uh, the ones that I'm on. <laughs> uh, but I watch all the other ones myself and really uh, absorb them because uh, it's a combination of uh, of some of the coolest people that I would never have found otherwise, uh, and uh, also people that I, I, I absolutely lovely, lovely people that I know that I have not been able to see this year, especially. Uh, yeah. So it's been uh, this this year, especially in Event Icons, has been really good to at least hear what people have been up to um, that I normally get to see in the hallways of uh, convention centers. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, all of our all star lineup at IMAX. I feel like I've basically just kind of had them on <laughs> throughout the year asking what they've been up to. So, Man, yeah, I, I, IMAX. Feel, I, I mean, know face to face IMAX, you know, I mean, they, Me they're still doing cool stuff. But yeah, I uh, yeah, this is uh, it, it, I, you either get one way or the other at the end of the year, you know, you either get uh, you miss things or you, you know, whatever. I'm actually looking forward to a lot of really big things in 2021. Yeah. Um, even like personally, I'll have some cool stuff to announce pretty soon. But uh, on on the macro level, like to me, uh, I'm excited to pivot into like what we're talking about today. Yeah. I'm really excited that I think this is the first year um, that there's going to be a real mass uh, event design um, landscape for virtual events where I don't believe uh, the majority of events, uh, the virtual events that took place in 2020 were, were truly designed um at least to their potential. Like I, it, people, they talked about the word pivot so much that like it was a drinking game. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and like I, I think of it like, and I think we're still in it to some extent, but like as like almost like a little mini pivot era where you went in with a plan and you, you had to, you know, punt uh, and go with something else. Next year, based on all projections, it seems like there's going to be a lot of, I mean, there's gonna be a lot less, let's say a lot less face-to-face -face attendees, period, at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, 
So this is the year where intentional experience design uh, will be used as opposed to pivoting, uh, which mm-hmm. is doing the best that you can. This is going to be more about, um, okay, we, we know this is going to happen. So let's, you know, let's use actually uh, design thinking to create some events. Yeah. And I think everyone's definitely craving that, that intentionality, because I think a lot of this year was just falling into it accidentally. So (laughs) hopefully this year or this upcoming year in 2021, we see a lot of changes there. Um, But yeah, I'm excited to talk design trends with you. Um, That's our topic for today. And um, before this, Nick and I were kind of talking about a little bit of different things um, in terms of design definitions, trends. So we have a lot of awesome stuff to share with everyone today. Um, But yeah, Nick, I want to ask for First of all, when you think of design, I think you have a really interesting point of view where you're kind of reshaping, you know, what maybe people think as a definition of design and what it actually is, um, or just multiple definitions. People can look at design and approach it from multiple different angles. So I'm really curious how you can kind of explain that and maybe differentiate it to, you know, have people rethink about it in a different way. Yeah, like I, uh, I, I think it really comes down to the fact that I, I've been in events since I was a teenager. Uh, and at that point, I was in events uh, from the capacity of like washing dishes, right? So for me, like it was uh, a real granular, real tactical, and then kind of a keyhole view into what experiences are, what gatherings are. Uh, throughout my career, you know, through high school, you know, and, and post and everything like that for the last maybe almost 25 years, I, I've had this potential to climb up this uh, uh, ladder, so to speak, and look down Uh, where I was and look at the bigger picture. And as soon as I, there's a lot of things that I thought I knew or or had had my thumb on. And then I got to, you know, push myself to another level. And I was like, oh no, it's actually broader than that. Or it's actually different than that. And I think one of the ones uh, that really stands out to me is, is event design. It, I think for the last, um, 15 years, it's really blown up as a terminology. I think it has become something that is either ambiguous uh, or it is something that is used uh, in in much different ways. Um, And I think that prior to that, it was exclusively used as a way to explain um, how you added accoutrements and uh, and little things and knickknacks and colors and, and, and flowers and balloons and whatever to an event. And that was event design. Event design was like picking a theme uh, for aesthetics, right? Um, And then what happened was uh, once there was more, I think, uh, investment in live events from like CMOs and it was much more ROI driven and it became more of a a serious business where um, there was specific expectations uh, coming out of it. Then there was more design thinking involved. Um, and design thinking is is a methodology um, that is is really flexible, and there's lots of variations on it. But to me, like the purest design is design thinking, which can be applied down to the floor arrangements, all the way up to strategic um, uh, choices made in order to create the uh, experience that you desire for your attendees. So in design thinking, there's stages. Um, it starts with uh, empathy. So you have to empathize. You have to really feel what it's going to be like for your attendee to go through this event uh, and, you know, what their pains are and what their expectations are and uh, the nuances that make them up. You have to define what your event is for, you know, what's the goal of it? Uh, what are you trying to accomplish now that you know um, what is needed in the world uh, and in the world of your attendees? Um, then you do my phase or my favorite phase, which is ideate. Um, this is uh uh, smart people, uh, hopefully, uh, guessing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you try to take a, a stab at what you think um, the attendees will um, do in order to create the behavioral change that you want. Um, you can really bolster the ideation uh, phase by using uh, data to tell you, mm. uh, really listening to what they're saying, saying with their feet, uh, saying with uh, their, you know, uh, how they register, uh, just all the different ways that they communicate with you uh, in order to really, you know, inform your ideation phase. Uh, and then you you basically create an event, uh, which in design thinking, which was really something that came from the world of productization and not from live events. It's been applied to live events in the last 15 years. Um, you prototype, and that's what it's called in, in um, 
which is really the biggest disconnect between I think most event uh, planners and and producers and um, and design thinkers and strategists is um, when you create something and you put it out in the world, it's called you know a prototype in in the design thinking world, and that's a really scary idea I think for most planners because they they their goal always is perfection. Um, and in productization and in many other uh, fields that use design thinking, like your first attempt at something or, or you doing something at all is actually um, a test. Uh, it's a guess. It is. It could fail, and failing is okay. And in the tech world, like failing is okay, and it's great to fail is a a phrase that is every third uh, TED talk. I think uh, it, it's like a <laughs> failing it's a, forward. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> another it's like good buzzword. An arch cliche. <laughs> uh, in the events world, uh, failing is uh, is drinking and uh, forgetting. It's it's moaning <laughs> and it's uh, it's PTSD. Like it, you don't yeah. you don't love it, right? Um, but uh, ultimately, um, the the last phase, which is I think the one that is probably um, could use the most amount of work when it comes to the event world is testing. So that is actually taking what you learned uh, and not just having a kind of a, a de facto post-event meeting, but actually using that as the launch to the next thing uh, and taking everything you, you, you put together and say, okay, what did we learn? Uh, how do we change? How do we pivot? How do we move forward? And uh, so that's really it. It's just uh, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. That's design uh, in its simplest form. Um, and you I like can, that. yeah. So we got to create a new mnemonic or something for it. I know. <laughs> I'll really. come up with one. <laughs> e D I P T. I'm sure there is one out there for starters. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, so when you think about design, uh, it's not just you know like this is the under the sea dance or or, or whatever or like this is a, a luau theme or whatever we were not doing. The Pantone 30. color of the year, or whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that said, all of that stuff is interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. All of that's th those things that happen as far as like, okay, uh, I use this this one at nauseum because like either you're gonna roll your eyes at it or you'll you know. But I'm just using it as an example because everybody knows. So let's talk mason jars as as a as a <laughs> oh, beverage God. as a beverage vehicle. Um, <laughs> let's so, talk. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, there was a time or or maybe uh donut walls or or cupcakes or or macaroons right so we <laughs> talk about uh we talk about design trends and frequently that's that's the extent that people are talking about every you know someone prominent some taste maker uh pulled off an event where they utilized this thing and it had a level of novelty and uh, and memorableness. Ugh, I don't know. That didn't come out well. <laughs> memorableness. Uh, memorableness. <laughs> that that was you know memorable. <laughs> that, that people copied right, and yeah. then people took that flattery as uh, you know a, a viralness or almost a meme like uh, a, you know positive thing, mm. and um, that um, that was oftentimes what we consider in the events world a a trend in events. Um, a design trend because you will start seeing more of it, even down to thematic designs. Uh, so, uh, like like a Gatsby theme, as an example, uh, was something that um, people were projecting, um, you know, this year, haha, uh, uh, <laughs> to be potentially something that would come up because it was easy, right? It's like right. Roaring Twenties, hey, it's back, <laughs> uh, and it's got a soundtrack and uh, gold uh, lattice, you know, all, all these visuals that are. Uh, and you know, champagne glasses that are wide, all these things that are um, iconic uh, in in a bow, right? So it it is, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I think that I find that to be like kind of anti-design personally, um, because that is that's saying like there is this packaged. Uh, already, you know, uh, thought out. There is a box, right? And like we've right. just pulled a box off the shelf, uh, and we've dusted it off, and we've opened it, and that's design. And it's actually the opposite of that. If you look at how design thinking works, you know, you wouldn't go skip to the end, right? Yeah. You wouldn't skip past ideate and or empathize and just like open the box and just pour it out. Um, you would ask questions. Now, here's the thing about mason jars and and about Gatsby <laughs> themes. It could be the right answer. This is where I lose some of the more pure people, you know, in design that are like, you know, my most of my people that I, I know or that are 
they're snobs. <laughs> but, you know, you get to be a snob no matter what if you're in, in events a long period of time. I, I've been to AV shows with AV people. It's it's terrible. I've been to catering <laughs> shows with caterers. It's terrible. They complain about the food. The other one complains about drape lines and kerning and bleed. They just can't have fun, right? Um, <laughs> and event people, when I, especially designers, like they pick apart, um, you know, like that's so last year pretty frequently but to me like that's that's just not the right question uh i i could see things and i'm very critical in my in my way at events when i see things that don't thematically align or or undermine um what the thing is about right so if it was mm -hmm. If, if it was about uh, bringing people together and yet there was no uh, networking component that was intentionally designed, you know, with it, like that was the theme, that was the the point of the uh, the gathering and you didn't see the intentional design to do that, I would say that's a huge miss. Right. Um, as opposed to whatever beverage container it is. Now, that said, it could be about like, um, oh boy. I'm trying to figure out a hypothetical that would make mason jars acceptable. Um, <laughs> it's I a mean, tough one. <laughs> I know it is tough. It is tough. Um, it, it might be, um, you know, uh, it might be on some kind of like um, making uh, making our organization uh, getting back to earth or something like that, mm. or uh, or um, you know, like upcycling or something like that where it would be well yeah th this is actually these pieces were uh donated from this you know local uh group that that makes these things that uses them for one purpose and normally throws them away but we you know we use them uh in order to uh, because that we had a function that required you know 500 of them so there you go that was that. intentional it was about you know a, a goal of potentially of an organization if that organization's goal was to uh, reduce their footprint and to be more uh, aligned with the community. I don't know. I'm making this up on the fly, which <laughs> is probably not a good idea. Um, and in that instance, I would say, oh, yeah, mason jars are extremely valid from a right. design standpoint because it meets, you know, it empathizes uh, with, you know, what uh, what the attendees are, are looking for, looking for an experience. Uh, and, and you're looking to, um, uh, with the define, you're looking to, change their minds about who you are and, and what you're about. Um, it, uh, you know, there was a lot of different choices, obviously, in the, in, the, in the ideation stage. Like, apparently, there was some variation in this hypothetical that made that the one to go with. Uh, you tried it out, and it was an acceptable beverage, you know, facilitator. Uh, and at the end of it, you know, people had good things to say about it. So it tests well. It goes through design thinking um, and, and works in that one instance that is uh, <laughs> I really had to stretch to get to. Um, and... Therefore, to me, that's a good design. So like there's definitely there's valid design and invalid design based on that definition. You know, does it does it empathize with your attendee? Does it help you with your goals? You know, does uh, did it work? Um, and yeah. uh, I like bringing it back to that empathy stage because I feel like that could solve so many answers, because even if you think Gatsby is going to be the hottest design trend of 2020, if you put yourself in, you know, the perspective of your attendees, maybe they're they would think it's tired and they, that's not what they're wanting and they want something more, especially after the sentiments of this year. I think there's going to be a lot of empathizing that's different. You know, the attendee that came to your event last year is coming to this event in a completely different mindset and a different way than totally. ever before. So I, I like starting with that for sure. And just having empathy always be your kind of litmus test and your reality check of, do people really want this or do I yeah. think people want this? Uh, and I think that I, uh, the, the I want this or I'm pushing this or I feel mm -hmm. this or whatever, I think is when, when a lot of the tactical aesthetic design trends come from that place, which I don't think is a really great place. And I think that's right. why people are disillusioned by trends people that are veterans and people that are like I've seen all I've seen all this stuff everything's circular etc everything's circular because you're on that ride right of right some person who uh or some paint company right who is trying to push paint <laughs> yeah. is telling you what paint is I mean like that's that's not a marker for design trend that is uh that's marketing right just right. like these lists of like who's the top professional this and that like that's marketing right like mm -hmm. that's that's been designed in order to first and foremost, like it's for the goal of something else. Um, so that's why I don't really believe in trends uh, on the aesthetic level like that, on the tactical level. Now, I do believe in, in strategic 
trends and I do yeah. believe in trends and, and this is where I, I speak mostly on is I believe in human trends. Mm, I uh, like that. So my yeah, so like when I think of like, okay, what are the trends we should be looking for? Uh, next year, uh, I think first off, you you really came across one that was that's really important. Is we're going to have to empathize with our attendees more so than ever because um, they have been disrupted at yeah. some level, right? We have to think about how they've been disrupted and how that plays into uh, our empathizing uh, our uh, stage when we get into things, and we have okay. to say, okay, even the data that we've had previously and the tests that we've run on prototypes, uh, you know. I, i.e. the events we've run and the, and the feedback, that might not be as applicable this year as it has been in the past. Because um, even before we get into uh, how we will execute events in a, a pandemic, post-pandemic, or what have you, we have to really get into the mindset of the attendee, virtual or otherwise. You know, like the virtual attendee, I think, requires a ton of empathy right now because... Mm -hmm. I mean, how how frequent are you hearing the the term Zoom fatigue? Right, like it's it's yep. a you know when you become a verb as a as a company, especially as a tech company, <laughs> that's like supposed to be this big win. Uh, like you know, I will go, very few people say I will bing that. Right? <laughs> oh gosh! Uh, right? So <laughs> I don't think uh, I've ever said it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they even tried to make Ask Jeeves, you know, a, a full idea. I asked Jeeves, <laughs> uh, that didn't work. Uh, but you Google things and. Zoom has become so big so fast mm -hmm. um, that it's kind of verb uh, is is Zoom fatigue, which isn't to say that Zoom is doing bad. It's just that the world, um, you know, is has all come through this one portal uh, so often that right. there's really no other way to do. It. I mean, it's it's a you know it's a feather in their cap that they're they're not saying Skype fatigue. Um, that yeah. they lost they lost their verb status. Um, but uh, what it, what it means is is that there is um, there was a mass adoption of something, um, and it wasn't uh, they, people crave more different, uh, or at the very least uh, to break it up from their normal experience of which they they've had their full fill of. You need to empathize with that. So like there there is uh, a design trend um, coming up in twenty twenty one that will that will first start with empathy. I think. Yeah, um, I love that. Yeah, yeah, no one, no one's mad at Zoom. I think we'll be using it forever and ever. Yeah, it, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's true. The zoomed out, even I've heard a lot, and just people, you know, coming at these with a really different perspective, and just already when you think of a virtual event and people are coming like tired and, and kind of dreading it, I think is a really important thing to latch onto and to. I think you can twist it in your favor, you know, and still plan a, a really amazing virtual event with these design elements. So yeah, let's let's get into them. What do you think is is going to be, you know, some big things to at least look at or start with going into 2021? Yeah, so again, I'm thinking of it at the mostly at the strategic level, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, and I'm trying to make the these broad enough that they would apply to potentially face-to-face -face and virtual, but especially in Q1 and Q2, let's say a little a little bit more emphasis in the virtual. Um, so starting with like empathy uh, of what is required for design, my thought is um, I think that with as many people who have to work from home um, and who will be watching uh, your events and partaking in your events uh, in their house with other things that they'll be doing at the same time, uh, I think a design trend that makes the most uh, sense uh, rooted in that empathy will be uh, shorter events over a longer period of time. Um, mm. So instead of and i think that really is one of the designs that is indicative of virtual um that is um of its potential that is different than face-to-face's -face potential like to say to someone i'd like you to fly to dallas um on monday uh to do this meeting uh, that we're going to learn some new thing uh from eight until ten then you're going to fly back and you're going to have your day of work and then you're going to have to fly back the next day and do two hours that's impossible, you know, right. that's just not going to happen. However, for virtual, you have the opportunity to um, not overload the people with education uh, and actually spread that over a period of time. Um, so things stick. But better than that is that you have the ability uh, and, and really one of the biggest educational flaws uh, in uh, in large face to face gatherings, uh, especially in the conference world, is the fact that you have no ability to implement what you've learned uh, quickly. Yes. So it requires you to bank that amongst 
too much other stuff then uh you know get in a plane and come back to work and look at the pile of work that you have to do because of all of the condensed amount and then once you dig yourself out to think that maybe you have the chance to implement those things that you learned uh, among 16 other things two weeks ago it's not ideal if you were to say the conference the virtual conference takes place uh, monday through friday uh it's two hours a day uh, and you pick your track uh, that you want to do or tracks potentially with two things, not too much. Um, the emphasis can then be put on implementing what you've learned quickly mm -hmm. uh, in that day itself. So you learn something that day, you get to use it that day, and then the next day you have the chance potentially to come back and talk about how you implemented that in order to make it conversational, uh, to make it more community-centric, uh, and to um, and to show um, that what you have learned uh, has had the opportunity to uh, impact you already, and and what really when you're when you're designing educational conferences or really even even internal meetings, the metric that for success is is action. You know, like right. it's I could I could talk to people, you know, the masses amount of people as I can, but if no one uses it, it's it's not really education. Right. Well, I like that too of mirror, mirroring what already works. Where do we yeah. think of like education? That that sounded exactly almost like a university course where you, right. you pick what you want to learn, you learn it over little chunks of time, you get to apply it, you can, you know, think about it, ruminate on it, read some more articles about it. And then you kind of now are a little bit more generally knowledgeable where you can implement it in your life. And I think that's what we kind of need to start going back to is I've heard that even with people like what, you know, when you get content Content, what works really well, Netflix, YouTube, things that kind of recommend things to you. So I think kind of going back on what things already work in real life rather than trying to make this new thing work and, you know, put it in front of people and hope for the best, you know, going back to those things that, you know, the structure is already kind of there. We just need to then apply it to whatever you're trying to do at your event. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, you saying Netflix really pops on another thing in mind as far as trends, I think, happening, uh, especially in the world of virtual events over the next year. And that will be uh, being inspired uh, to design your, ex your virtual experiences from uh, sources outside of events. Mm -hmm. So like the face-to-face -face events that you've produced uh, have some, some common DNA with uh, virtual events, but not as much as you would think. Um, right. Or we wouldn't have been expounding upon uh, all the virtues of the things we've been saying for face to face in in lieu of uh, getting together on screens up until this pandemic. Like this has given us no choice. So we have to learn how to do it. But before we've actually just been fighting it. And what we've done is we've built up all the things that face to face has over virtual. And mm -hmm. I think those are true. I think what we haven't done and haven't had to do because it wasn't our business is that we haven't learned all the things that virtual has over face to face, uh, and taking face to face and trying to uh, apply the same criteria of of experiential, of sensory uh, uh, washing over, and of hospitality, and applying it to virtual isn't going to work. Like right. it's not, it's not a an experience of hospitality. You know, no one. You know, people at best they greet you and you come in to the chat. <laughs> It's not Where are true. you from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's really not it, right? Yeah. Um, so those things don't work, and those things uh, are absolutely do work in face to face. And for virtual, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to start getting inspired by places outside of um, outside of face to face events. So I'm looking at um, I'm looking at esports. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at uh, Peloton. Uh, I'm looking at uh, Netflix for sure. Uh, I'm looking at all the places that command attention um, and are different ways to consume uh, emotional change through a screen. Um, yeah. And I think that like the example of, well, we could just have to make everything smaller, 15 second, you know, 30 second videos, etc. Uh, for all things is, is um, I, I don't think that's necessarily the, it even though like, so many people have been uh, for the last 10 years really driving that down like oh a goldfish memory or you know if it can't be any longer than two minutes can't be any longer than a minute all these things meanwhile the esports world commands streaming attention for hours at a time on mm -hmm. on oftentimes a daily basis uh, or the length of a, an average length of a of a sex or a successful podcast is an hour long 
there are all of these different uh, places in the in the digital world, let's say, that are succeeding in these ways that we wished our events would uh, to command attention. So I think what we need to do is we need to look outside of what we know in the face to face world um, and say, well, that wouldn't work here. The answer is it, it wouldn't. You need to go yeah. where it is working and be inspired there. So I think that from a um, a design standpoint, as far as trends, I think that it will come down to adopting some of the things that are is, that is working on in all these other virtual spaces, like Peloton as an example. Like it, it's a it's there are people selling bikes, right? Like that's what right. they're doing, <laughs> but they're doing it through. Um, uh, community and they're doing it through things happening at a specific time. Those yep. could be all on demand. They don't have to be at a specific time, right? But there is a live element. So like when you deconstruct their success, you find that, you know, there is uh, activity and behavioral change that is taking place through a screen um, that is creating raving fans of people. Like if you've met a person with a Peloton, they've told you to buy a Peloton. Like, Oh like, yeah. And it's also that relationship too. I feel like it's not just them watching someone behind a screen. Some people feel such an affinity for their favorite instructor yeah. that they're like, Oh, I can't miss this class. Like so-and-so is doing this at 6 yeah. PM tonight. I have to Esports go. Esports is like that too. Like, right. Yeah. It, or, or even, even streamers, you know, like they, they say like they really, they really connect with the personality yeah. And that personality is uh, incredibly authentic, transparent, um, and uh, is about developing community. Uh, and I think that like speakers who are aloof, uh, who you know are, are a little bit dry or or what have you, um, that don't um, have the opportunity for the go back, the back and forth, uh, or are coming at it from different angles. Like I, I don't think that. Um, those people will survive in in this world where um, you don't get to, you know they're not just one of the people that you're meeting in a meeting once a year, um, right? And more points of contact too. Like I think that like one of the like if it, even though those streamers they know that when they increase their uh, uh, volume of content creation uh, in periods of time when they do that, like they they increase their um, their retention of their fans, and like yeah. uh, we can't just have that one annual meeting per year in the virtual world. Uh, and, and call it a day like we need to be able to spread it out and I think that wow I never even thought about it like that like if a YouTuber just did one YouTube video a year <laughs> people would be it. like that's great cool <laughs> yeah. And, yeah and oftentimes they don't really find their stride in their community until a certain until they actually go through design thinking themselves like mm -hmm. if you watch the early videos of like Ryan's toy reviews as an example like it it's it's not what it ended up it being uh, right a, at all um, and I mean he he's making like 20 million dollars a year as like a seven-year-old so that kid <laughs> there's there's something that kid's been monetized you know well yeah but i'm sure yeah, like, you, like you said with design like there's so much uh probably there was probably a lot of testing they probably looked at all the results and analyzed that and really looked into how to you know kind of improve things over time um so are we are we going to be seeing a bunch of youtube personalities you think uh, as some speakers or you know someone that has that connection to the audience in that way I think I think that'll be required um, in the way the same way that it's required of other disciplines currently to have uh, a more active, open relationship with their uh, their fans, because now that um, everything's being done online in that way, um, I think that it will drive people to uh, want to see it. And, and if you see that, like the, the events that people have, you know, even in the esports world, uh, like there is kind of a, a road to this thing. Uh, right. That is a big deal. Right. And I think that like that style of um, uh, hype, so to speak, will be something that events will have to do as well. And it, it, it'll just that. require. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I just I think that like personalities are going to have to be um, bigger. Uh, and I think that like uh, people are going to have to have different kinds of training to be camera ready. Um, yeah. Which brings me to my like last point, I think, for, for trends for uh, virtual events specifically, is that if you want an education in virtual events, my my thought right now has been uh, to read books on screenwriting. Um, oh, yeah, I've I've got a few um, and uh, I think McKee is probably one of the better ones. Uh, but but ultimately what you're looking for is structure. Uh, because when you design an event in virtual, you're really designing a um, 
an experience that is consumed on a screen, um, which gives you uh, a lot of freedom in some ways, and then it restricts you in other ways. Mm -hmm. It gives you the freedom to um, to play around with time and to play around with space in a way that you can't in face to face. Um, you can like this. This is the the hypothetical example I've been giving a lot lately, and I, it's it's like I don't know for whatever reason it's been working for me. So the Olympics. Okay. Okay. There are sports I believe in the Olympics that are objectively boring. Um, that <laughs> that would would command no attention if they were just happening on the side of the street. Uh, and one of the ones that comes to mind for me, and I apologize, I guess, to probably just Canadians, uh, <laughs> curling. And it's fine to apologize to Canadians because they'll apologize back. Um, oh, <laughs> this is so polite. Uh, curling is 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 a broom and a rock and ice. It, it, it isn't like high impact, like you know, like American football. You can like if you see it over, you know, across your shoulder, you're like, what is going on? Like those people getting yeah. concussions and all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, <laughs> and meanwhile, it's it's got the um, the I don't know the sex appeal of janitorial work, right? It, it's someone's brooming curlers uh, don't come for us <laughs> yeah i know sorry yeah. curling fans uh, that said it's missing a component in order to sell it to people uh and just like the way that i would say that as i've been in so many dry associations in different industries <laughs> of like again not to go on dentistry or or even um uh, what was the, the something sciences uh, for morticians the mor mortuary sciences <laughs> You're there's making some, a lot of enemies today, Nick. <laughs> I know. I, oh, trust me. There's nothing I do that doesn't. But like, there are things that are objectively um, boring to, to the people who are not already in that world, right? So if you're in that right. world, it's probably all interesting, right? Like, there's things that I'm into that would bore the tears out of majority of people. Um, <laughs> that said, you can elevate pretty much anything through storytelling uh, if you understand how to hit those arcs. And I think that that's what's missing in a lot of virtual event design is the idea that like in, in the Olympics for curling, they show the person, you know, starting to do whatever they do to get the ice ready. Uh, and then they cut to uh, pre-recorded content from when that kid was, uh, you know, or storytelling uh, of that uh, uh, athlete when they were eight years old and their dad sweeping uh, um, this school as a janitor to have a second job in order to have the money to send that person to curling academy or whatever. And uh, <laughs> this is all, I don't know. We don't know I clearly works. know nothing about curling. <laughs> uh, so, um, and, and like, you know, so like they, you know, that person always thinks about their dad working, you know, hours, extra hours doing that thing and uh, to afford them the opportunity to, you know, be in, in this far off land to be able, and now let's go back to that the ice. That is so true. And then, I'm a sucker for those. Me too, right? Like <laughs> you tell like, me where someone comes from, and I suddenly love them, yeah. and I just want the best for them and their happiness, and for them to win gold. It, so it's in, in, <laughs> in a storytelling like uh, design, that's called having stake. So you mm -hmm. have stake in the outcome. So before that, you have no stake in the outcome. If that person does well or doesn't, you you don't care. And therefore, your investment in in taking it all in and, and being emotionally impacted, which is the key, uh, emotional mm -hmm. change is definitely the key when it comes to virtual events versus uh, the other kinds of uh, opportunities you have with hospitality and uh, a sensory change that you can take you can use in face to face. It's about emotional change. In that instance, you can you can get someone to cry watching curling right and, right and and if you didn't have that storytelling element that brought a stake in that that uh, aligned it with something that is human uh because you're in this inhuman box right like we're we can't, i can't reach right. out and touch anything um yeah. then you you be able to utilize all that you have in in the design of uh what do you call it, uh, virtual events to get to their fullest potential. So I think that like people have to go back, you know, or, or take another, uh, uh, you know, bit of time and dedicate it to how storytelling is crafted. And I think there's been lip service given in the events industry to storytelling as a trend and as something mm -hmm. before, but really it's, it's still been an, an aspect of hospitality, you know, like hospitality first, it's all the, we don't want to make, we make sure that the, you know, the, the food lines aren't long, that this happens on time. Everything's about time and time and time and time. And it's not about, okay, like how do you emotionally change these people in order to take them through this mm. process that makes them feel this at this time and this at this time. And there was a lot of work being done in, in, uh, 
in biometric feedback and uh, and even micro expressions uh, and recording those to determine like how people are going through an event. But like the the storytelling bit um, is it's just not as pure in the face to face as much as it is in uh, a virtual. So I think right. people need to really become storytellers this year. Um, I love that. Yeah. I think that's why, too, even to go back to something that works outside of virtual events is TEDx, too. Those are such yeah. inspirational, you know, you really get to know someone. They're also delivering a message. Sometimes they're even low-key selling something to you or they want you to buy a book or something. But you're just so swept away by their story and who they are that you're just immersed in it. And I love that as a trend. Um, I hate to cut you off, but we are running out of a little bit of time. Um, I would love to bring you back on maybe next year as we get closer to whatever sure. hybrid in-person hu- future we're seeing um, and just keep going into trends. Because I do think, especially over 2021, don't you think everything will just evolve? I, <laughs> I think the trends Absolutely. going into the year are going to be really different coming out of the year too. So we've, we've only had prototype events for virtual in 2020 for the most part. I think right. uh, the first event to look at for inspiration uh, in 2021 will be CES because they determined mm-hmm. uh, in early summer that they would be going to that. So that, that alludes to a better potential for intentional uh, experience design uh, oh, because so they would have had the time for that. So that's the first Q1 thing that's on my radar as far as paying attention. Um, awesome. But like, pay, if you're going to pay attention to trends this year at all, pay attention to human trends because those okay. are going to be much more important. Um, like last year, we had Black Lives Matter rallies. Uh, we had a lot of um, people really understanding and having a better understanding empathetically of people's you know needs for specific pronouns and and, mm. and like how uh, how identity is evolving. Like there is an evolution, and also like what's the reaction to people being by themselves and cooped up for a year? Pay attention to and trying to empathetically connect to the human trends and then everything else you have should flow from that. Oh, I love that. I think that's such a great last thing to leave everyone with. And yeah, it's it's going to be different. Humans have changed. And whether it's for the better or the worse, uh, you know, designing events around that I think is awesome and super important. Um, Nick, thank you so much. I always love talking to you. I feel like you say everything in the most eloquent way. (laughs) I really admire your speaking. (laughs) Um, But yeah, no, thank you so much. And for everyone who joined us too, we had a few uh, viewers off and on. So thank you for everyone who didn't live. Um, Again, be posted on our blog. So if you want to check it out, um, event-icons.com, go subscribe, make sure you can watch all the episodes. Um, And then, yeah, look out for Nick again. I will have you back on next year for sure, because I just feel like you have so much great insight. So we'll hear hear about the curlers between now and then, hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the curlers, the dentists and the mortuary people are are coming for you. (laughs) But that's okay. We're together. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. (laughs) All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful holiday season. Um, I think we do have a few more event icons coming up at the end of this year. So we'll see you then. Um, But have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch all of the bonus content, resources mentioned, and an invite to our Facebook and LinkedIn groups, head to www.event-icons.com. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode, share your biggest takeaway, and just tag your social media posts with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon right here on Hashtag Event Icons.